A town called Pueto, in a remote corner of the Democratic Republic of Congo. These people have come from an area near the border with Zambia that's been called the Triangle of Death. According to a United Nations report published in April this year, widespread violence has been committed there by rebels known as Mai Mai. As many as 200,000 people have been driven from their homes. The Mai Mai came to the village. There were seven of them. They robbed me and tied my hands with ropes. I managed to escape to the forest where I cut myself free. The people have come here to collect food which is being distributed by the UN World Food Programme. Maize flour, pulses, salt and vegetable oil are being given out to some 1,600 families. The Mai Mai came in the night and they burnt the houses, my house included. We fled without anything. We heard there was food being given out here, so I came to feed my children. At a nearby health centre, special nutritional products are being given to pregnant women, nursing mothers and children under two years of age. The aim is to prevent malnutrition among the displaced people and the local inhabitants. What's happening in Puerto is uh, a hidden crisis. The Puerto is uh, at a very far uh, distance from uh, everywhere. The roads are very bad and reaching people are difficult, but WFP is uh, doing all its best to reach those uh, beneficiaries. Many of the displaced live with local households. Others have to build their own huts with branches and straw. Here, on the edge of Mwashi village, dozens of families are living in makeshift shelters. Yes, I do. Yeah. This food we're receiving helps us. This is the second time we've received food from WFP, and it means the children and I can eat. I don't know what we'll do when it runs out. What these people want more than anything is to be able to go home. It will take days of walking, but they're ready to set off as soon as there is peace. Here in central Yaoundé, Cameroon, traders are selling some of the region's most prized delicacies. Depending on the season, grasshoppers, termites, or in this case, larvae of the palm weevil beetle, line the stalls. I eat insects like this because they provide nutrition. They nourish the body. They're not too fatty, but have lots of good ingredients. If you eat these all the time, you will rarely get sick. Insects make a positive contribution to diets here, as they are packed with protein, vitamins, fiber, and minerals. And it's not only their contribution to local diet that's important. They're also providing earning opportunities. Here, in the forest surrounding the village of Jeng, it's the grasshopper season. Philomen Enama is collecting grasshoppers, along with other women from the village. Some of them she cooks to feed her family of seven. The rest she takes to market for sale. Insects are good because when we no longer have crops in our fields, they give us a means to live as we prepare the insects to eat. And also we can sell them, so they really do provide for us. In the height of the season, one woman may collect four water bottles full of grasshoppers, which she will sell for the equivalent of 15 euros in one day. The role of women in collecting insects is very important, since in many parts of the world, women are responsible for ensuring that there is food on the table to feed the family. Until recently, insects were considered an inexhaustible resource. However, human population growth has led to over-harvesting of certain species. 
While forest fires and habitat degradation due to unsustainable logging has brought some species to the brink of extinction. The rearing and domestication of insects can help the conservation of wild insect populations while simultaneously contributing to livelihoods and food security. Insects have a huge potential for both feed and food. We're already seeing developments in terms of using insects as animal feed and also being incorporated onto menus and into processed foods. While we won't be seeing insects on the table of a Sunday lunch anytime within the next decade, we know that insects have a huge potential and we hope that slowly but surely this can be realized. Population growth, urbanization and the growing middle class are all contributing to a growing global demand for protein. Insects contain high levels of essential nutrients and vitamins, as well as high protein content comparable to meat products. It's hoped that insects will be considered a viable supplement to human diet, not only here in Central Africa, but in many other parts of the world. High on the Andean Plateau in Bolivia, a Kayawaya traditional healer makes an offering to the gods, just as his ancestors did for centuries. It's an ancient practice meant to protect local herds. Although alpacas and llamas were domesticated thousands of years ago, they've never been highly valued. Now they may be the only hope people like the Kayawaya have for a future year. We are 4,400 meters above sea level. You can see it's deserted. There isn't much pasture and it is not possible to plant crops because of the frost. So the only thing to sell is the alpaca. Some tried raising sheep, but with little success. Now with support from the UN's International Fund for Agricultural Development, many ranchers are realizing that this ancient relative of the camel is not only easier on the environment, but may be their best shot at earning a living, particularly by taking advantage of a growing global demand for alpaca fleece, says Guillermo Villamelo of IFAD. For the markets, it is important to generate volumes and at a high quality to negotiate a good price. If we don't improve camelid production methods, all of these farmers are going to migrate to the poor ghettos of the city. Six years ago, IFAD and the Bolivian government launched a multi-million dollar project to help thousands of ranchers increase their incomes. Among the many things ranchers learned, how to improve genetic lines and health of their herds. Even the Kayawaya's knowledge of medicinal herbs was utilized, in this case to create an effective treatment for stomach parasites. Justo Apazamamani was among the first in his community to be convinced that alpacas and llamas could be a root out of poverty. I asked myself, why do I have to live in extreme poverty? Many times we had nothing to eat. I talked to my dad and I said, why don't we buy other animals with better economic prospects? Justo's family began breeding their alpacas with superior varieties from Peru, eventually creating a stronger, healthier herd. He also selected animals for their coats. White fleece, he discovered, fetched the best price in the marketplace. The first time we sold 25 male alpacas, my father received a suitcase full of money. He could not believe it. We went back home and I went out to graze the animals. When I came back in the afternoon, my father was still counting the money. Then he understood that raising alpacas was a good business. And not only good business for local ranchers, small enterprises from jerky production to weaving have sprung up across the country. Each year, Patrona Flores and her weavers cooperative spins about 1,200 kilos of alpaca fleece into shawls and scarves, destined for markets in Bolivia and Europe. Without money, we couldn't travel or leave. Now, my children are in university, and it's the beginning of a new life. As new markets and products continue to evolve, 
Many believe the populations that have existed here for thousands of years may now have a future on these high Andean plains. Something the Kayawaya say could be the answer to their prayers.